I'm going to ask for your suggestions about what to do. It's not a test. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. If you don't answer, I'll do it myself, but it'll be more fun if you make suggestions. So uh, first, uh, one thing we need to know is uh, what is the x-ray source? So, uh, you're a computational physicist. You've been sitting back in your office. Someone walks in your door and hands you this spectrum and says, tell me what's in this spectrum. So one of the first things you would ask is, what, what is the x-ray source? What, what materials were in the x-ray source? Was it copper, krypton, tungsten? And then secondly, uh, what, what spectrometer recorded that spectrum? What are the properties, the capabilities of that spectrometer? So here's the answer to those first two questions. That spectrum was recorded at a laser facility. It was the uh, Titan laser at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California. And the target was a gallium arsenide wafer. So what does that tell you about these spectral lines? Well, there are two groups of spectral lines. They look kind of similar, similar patterns. So we're looking for pattern recognition. So uh, one group is probably gallium. The other group is arsenic. And if you uh, have your this chart, uh, gallium is atomic number 31. And arsenic is atomic number 33. So gallium has a lower atomic number. Those spectron, those uh, uh, transitions would have lower photon energy from the lower atomic number in arsenic. So, so if we had an energy scale, we could say one is gallium and the other is arsenic, but we don't have an energy scale. So here's the answer to what spectrometer. The spectrometer was a transmission crystal spectrometer, and it covered 9 to, 9 to 11 kilovolt energy range. And this spectrometer was high resolution, so it was called the high resolution crystal spectrometer, very original. Here's a photograph of the inside of the target chamber at the Titan laser in California. The a uh, laser beam comes in through this port into the vacuum chamber. The gallium arsenide target is here. And then here's the high resolution transmission crystal spectrometer. And the uh, size of this chamber is about uh, one meter or so. So now we know the spectral lines are from gallium and ars arsenic and the energy range is 11 is 9 to 11 kilovolts. And it, it turns out uh, energy increases to the right. So now we can say these are lines from gallium and these are lines from arsenic. Fairly close in atomic numbers, so these are probably the same type of transitions, but just from the two different elements and shifted in energy. Okay, now uh, uh, we need a energy scale. So, so how do we establish the energy scale? Remember the first thing you do is you look for the spectral lines you know. So what spectral lines did we talk about during the first hour? We talked about the helium-like resonance lines, the lithium-like satellites, and the characteristic x-ray lines from the neutral or singly ionized atoms. So let's look for those. The uh, helium-like, uh, lithium-like transitions are higher energy than the transitions from the neutrals. So if energy goes from left to right increasing, these are from the high energy charge states, probably uh, lithium-like, helium-like on this side of the distribution. And then the characteristic X-ray lines will be on the lower side of the distribution. So let's make a guess. Let's guess that the lower strong transitions are the characteristic X-ray lines from gallium. And the uh, K-alpha-1 and K-alpha-2 should have a ratio of 2 to 1. 
So that looks, looks pretty good. And then over here, uh, maybe these two are the same transitions in arsenic. So we have the K lines in gallium. Let's look for the K betas. So there are probably the K beta 1 and 2, which also should have a, a relative line ratio of roughly 1 to 2. So here's what we are guessing so far, but we still don't have an energy scale. So let's use the very, very well-known, accurately known transition energies of the characteristic transitions to establish the energy scale. So we're going to use these two K lines from gallium, gallium K betas, and the arsenic K alphas, and let's, let's calculate the energy scale. So, so now we have a, a, what we think is a good energy scale. And it does go from roughly nine, uh, 9 to 11 kilovolts, like we were told. So now that we know the um, K alpha lines and the, what we think are the uh, lithium and helium-like lines, uh, we know these transition energies, so you know, that's probably good. What are the other features? So if we know these are neutral or singly ionized, and, and if we know these are two electron ions, three electron ions, let's just count. Four electron, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So perhaps these features are from the lithium-like to the neon-like charge states. And similarly in arsenic, but uh, what's the difference between the gallium spectral line distribution and the arsenic. What do you notice? Something is missing from the arsenic. So the, the uh, arsenic is a higher Z element. It's somewhat less ionized because it's higher Z. So the helium-like and the lithium-like lines appear to be missing from the arsenic spectrum, and that's what you would kind of expect. So, so things are looking good so far. To go further, we have to simulate a spectrum. We have to use a code to, to simulate the spectrum because we think we know what the charge states are, you know, so we're ready to simulate this spectrum. And then we can check and see if these uh, uh, line identifications are correct or not. So there are uh, many codes. Um, there's the Cowan code, there's the uh, Flycheck and Grant GRASP code, QLAC, BAC, you know, lots of codes. Uh, me being an experimentalist, um, I'm going to look for the easiest to use code. So it turns out uh, that Cowan code and, and Flycheck are quite accessible on websites, easy to use. Even, a, even an experimentalist can, can use these codes. So uh, let's just look at the uh, G, GF values from the Cowan code website. So these uh, sticks uh, represent the GF values, which is which gives a indication of the relative line, spectral line intensities. And um, so, so here are the GF values uh, convolved with the 10 eV Gaussian to kind of simulate the experimental spectrometer resolution for the uh, gallium like uh, lithium trans, uh, lithium like gallium lithium like transitions, and here's the experimental spectrum. So uh, with this uh, 10 eV shift, uh, you can kind of see the matching uh, starting, starting to emerge, and here are the gallium uh, beryllium-like transitions and the arsenic carbon-like transitions. So it looks like the assignments of all of those spectral features, it looks good. So now that we are confident of the line identifications, let's uh, really uh, use another code to simulate the uh, spectral line intensities using a uh, 
kinetics code, and let's see if we can determine the temperature and density of the plasma region. So, so what code should be, what uh, kinetics code should be used? Uh, one that's easy to use, accessible, and that would be the flycheck code. Well, first of all, uh, if we're going to calculate a spectrum, we need to start out with a temperature and a density. We have to plug that into the code. So what, what temperature and density should we use? Uh, we have to have a guess to start out with. Uh, earlier in the week, it was mentioned a couple of times that the uh, most abundant charge state in a thermal plasma has uh, ionization potential from that most abundant charge state. Uh, ionization potential is, is roughly three times the temperature or five times the temperature. So uh, here's a plot of the ionization potentials versus charge state of the various ions in gallium and arsenic. So when you uh, start out with the neutral, uh, it's got a small ionization potential as you Ionize up, you come to the neon-like closed shell, very tightly bound closed shell. So there's a jump in the ionization potential at that uh, neon-like uh, 10 electron ion. And then you continue ionizing, and now you get to the uh, helium-like closed shell. So from the lithium-like weakly bound charge state to the helium-like tightly bound charge state, there's a big jump in ionization potential. And here are the ionization potentials on a log scale in uh, kilovolts. So if our, um, if our temperature is about a factor of three less than the ionization potential, and we know that we have ions between neon and lithium and also some weak um, abundance of helium-like, uh, let's pick a ionization pot potential, let's say six. You know, that's kind of in this range of ionization. Let's divide it by three, and we get two, two kilovolts. So that's a, that's a reasonable electron temperature to plug into the code. Now, the density is a little bit more difficult, but we start out with a solid gallium arsenide target. So solid densities, 10 to the 23, 24, whatever. But we know that plasma expands as it blows off <coughs> from that solid surface. So the, the density is going to be some orders of magnitude below solid density. If it expands, you know, a factor of 10 to 100, it's going to go down by several orders of magnitude at least. So let's pick a density of 10 to the 19. So now we run uh, flight check simulations for a fixed electron density because we have confidence that that's in the ballpark. We have less confidence in the, in the density. We have confidence in the temperature. So we'll fix the temperature at 2 kilovolts, which we think is correct, and we'll vary the, the uh, density. So here are the ion abundances for a fixed 2 kilovolt um, temperature and a variable density where we vary the density from uh, uh, 5 times 10 to the 18, which is th these curves, this curve, and uh, 1 times 10 to the 19 is very close. And then there's a shift in ionization when we go to up in density to 5 times 10 to the 19. <coughs> So you see the uh, density dependence is, is weak until you get over uh, up to, say, 5 times 10 to the 19. Certainly above 1 10 to the 19, below the density dependence is weak. When you go higher, it becomes stronger. So here are the calculated, this is the calculated spectrum for 5 times 10 to the 19, 1 19, 5 18, so take a look at this uh, spectral distribution. And if you recall the experimental spectrum, let's see how they match up. Uh, do, you, do you recall the largest 
the uh, most intense charge state for gallium is carbon-like. So let's see which density gives us the most intense carbon-like. And also notice also that the uh, lithium-like, uh, helium-like are weaker, and uh, neon-like is weak. Fluorine, oxygen-like are stronger. So just kind of keep that pattern in mind, and let's see which density is best. So here's the carbon-like. And um, 119, 518, carbon-like is strongest, higher density, the uh, higher ch uh, charge state becomes comparable to carbon. So it's probably going to be uh, somewhere in this density range. But the, um, uh, when you go to lower density, the, the uh, lower charge states come up and they're a little bit too strong here. And also, you'll see a subtle change in the lithium-like transitions. If you recall from earlier in the week, the lithium-like satellite transitions, those are sensitive to both temperature and density. So there's a very subtle change here. I don't know if you can notice it. But uh, this ratio of the helium-like Y transition to the lithium-like Q transition, see there's a subtle change there. It's kind of kind of flat here, slightly skewed, and then uh, cannot really uh, resolve the two there. So this is uh, what the spectrum actually looks like. So let's pick uh, 1 times 10 to the 19 and vary the temperature. So we're fixing the density at 119 and we're varying the uh, temperature from uh, 1.5 kilovolts, 2 kilovolts, 2.5 kilovolts. Uh, now there's a huge change in the uh, ion, uh, 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 the abundances of the ions in the plasma. There's a very large change with temperature. So this is very sensitive to temperature. It was rather insensitive to density, but it's very sensitive to temperature. So we should be able to determine the plasma temperature accurately and the plasma density somewhat less accurately. So which one uh, looks most similar to the data? Well, it's this one uh, where the carbon uh, emission is highest. Uh, when you go to a lower temperature, the uh, lower charge states, uh, neon-like, fluorine-like, are, are way too strong compared to the higher charge states, much too intense. When you go to higher temperature, then the lower charge states are way too intense. So it looks like around two kilovolts is a good uh, guess for the plasma temperature, a good guess so far. Also, you see the uh, satellite line ratios are changing drastically. In particular, the uh, Y to Q ratio. So, so now we know that the a, a ballpark guess for the temperature is two kilovolts, and a guess for the uh, density is one times ten to the nineteen. But there are these uh, subtle changes in the lithium-like satellite, so we need to really uh, do some more detail calculations for those uh, lithium-like satellite transitions. Um, so, so here's the experimental spectrum, and uh, once again, these are the, are the Cowan code uh, GF values for these uh, letter designations, which, uh, which are in that previous table. I would like for you to uh, remember the M and T satellite transitions. So fix, fix this in your memory. M and T. Uh, to proceed, we need to think about the hotter electron component. In laser-produced plasmas, the laser intensity is very, is very high. We can have a thermal distribution like we've found is about 2 kilovolt temperature. But uh, laser radiation is very intense. Electrons can be accelerated during 
during the time of the laser pulse to much higher energy than two kilovolts. In some cases, it can be 100 kilovolts or 500 kilovolts if the laser is extremely intense. So we need to think about the possibility of a super thermal hot electron component, much higher energy than the two kilovolt thermal plasma. Uh, we know that's present because, because we see the characteristic gallium and arsenic characteristic X-ray lines, uh, they're in the spectrum. The uh, energy to produce those lines, to produce a, a 1s vacancy, uh, that, that is as high as uh, almost 12 kilovolts. So we have to have uh, an abundance of at least 12 kilovolt electrons to produce those characteristic X-ray lines. Moreover, um, in the plasma, uh, we think the temperature is about 2 kilovolts in the plasma, so those, those neutrals and singly ionized ions that produce the characteristic X-ray lines, they should not be present in this 2 kilovolt plasma because we know from the ionization potentials those uh, neutrals, low ionization stages, they have very low, very low ionization potential. So the ionization at 2 kilovolts should be very rapid. So there should be practically no abundance of the low, very low charge states which produce the characteristic X-ray lines. But, but we see them in the spectrum. So how can this happen? So if this is our uh, gallium arsenide wafer, and this will be uh, millimeters in size, and the laser is focused to about uh, one, about uh, uh, 100 microns or 0 0.1 millimeter. So this is very, very hot plasma, which is blowing off from the, from the board. And uh, this is a intense laser. So, th so the plasma is about two kilovolts, but yet we think there are much higher energy electrons present somewhere. So uh, high, high energy electrons are accelerated during the laser pulse to very high energy, and those high energy electrons propagate out from the focal spot. So high, high energy electrons propagate to this cold gallium arsenide material which surrounds the hot plasma. So the characteristic X-rays are coming from the neutrals in the surrounding gallium arsenide wafer. They're not present in the hot plasma. They're coming from the colder material outside the focal spot. And it turns out to, to propagate some distance from the focal spot through this solid density material, the uh, electron energy has to be at least tens of kilovolts to have that range in the solid gallium arsenide material. So from previous studies, and this has been studied quite a bit, there's a, a rule of thumb uh, formula where the superthermal electron energy, often called T hot, is given by this formula. It's uh, proportional to I lambda squared. I lambda squared is the is uh, proportional to the so-called quiver energy, that oscillatory energy that the electron has in that strong laser field. That's called the quiver energy. And if that oscillating electron collides with the nucleus, then it will fly off with that quiver energy. So that's how the fast electrons fly off and propagate outside the focal spot. 
I lambda squared is a, a unit you'll, a quantity you'll see quite often. Where, where I has uh, real units of watts per centimeter squared, uh, that should be um, not, one, not one third, but uh, I think 10 to the 17 watts per centimeter squared. The uh, laser wavelength of the Titan laser at Livermore is one micron wavelength. So if you plug those numbers into this equation with, with this correction, you'll get 30 kilovolts, which is high enough for the electrons to propagate through the solid material outside the focal spot. So now we know uh, there's a 30 kilovolt hot electron co component, and we have to include that in the flycheck code simulations, but, but we don't know how many electrons ha have 30 kilovolts. Most, most will have two kilovolts, and some small percentage of that electron population will have been accelerated, will have scattered, outside the focal spot, but that fraction of hot electrons is an unknown. So, so now you uh, not only vary temperature and density, but you also vary the hot electron fraction, so we have kind of three unknowns. So we calculate spectra over that uh, phase space of three unknowns, and uh, calculate the correlation between the experimental spectrum and each of those calculated spectra. And then you can plot on a, a two-dimensional plot of temperature and density with different fractions of hot electrons. This plot, uh, a correlation plot happens to be for 2% of the total electron population, 2% having 30 kilovolt energy, and the highest correlation is 1100 EV temperature, quite quite narrow in temperature, so we can say it's about plus or minus maybe 5%. And then it's a, a little bit broader in density, but it's about 3 times 10 to the 19 plus or minus, say, 50%. And then uh, varying the fraction of hot electrons, it's about 2.5% uh, plus or minus some, some small fraction. So now we can do uh, fly check calculations with the 1100 um, EV temperature and the uh, 3 times 10 to the 19 density, the 2.5% abundance of 30 kilovolt electrons. Now we can calculate a more accurate fly check uh, spectrum, which is shown here. Uh, these are the line intensities, and this is the experimental spectrum. And I've uh, convolved the, the uh, calculated intensities. I've convolved with a um, profile that uh, simulates the uh, spectral resolution in the experimental spectrum. So I've convolved each of these line intensities with a Voigt profile. I uh, recall a Voigt profile as a combination of a Gaussian and a Lorentzian convolution. And the Gaussian component has a full width half maximum corresponding to the thermal Doppler broadening, the 1100 EV uh, broadening but uh, Doppler width is uh, uh, related to the ion temperature, not the electron temperature. So we know the electron temperature is 1.1 kilovolts, and the, the ion temperature is the same because the equilibration time in this rather dense plasma is about a picosecond. So that's fast electron-ion equilibration during the longer laser pulse, which was several nanoseconds, much longer. So during that several nanosecond laser pulse, the electrons and ions are being heated, but they tend to have the same temperature because of the fast equilibration time. We add in uh, some uh, detector broadening, and we've measured the spatial resolution of our detector in the laboratory as part of our calibration process. So we know uh, how much
detector broadening to add in to our line profile. And it turns out that the detector broadening spatial resolution profile fits a Voigt profile very accurately, so it has a Gaussian component and a uh, Lorentzian component. So we add in the Gaussian component of detector broadening, and then the crystal broadening, uh, intrinsic spectrometer crystal broadening, we've also measured in the laboratory. And if I have time, I'll talk about how we do that later. Uh, Lorentzian, we have the uh, natural lifetime broadening. Uh, lifetime of the level uh, gives some broadening in energy. Uh, for these transitions, we know what the uh, radiative decay rate A is, the Einstein coefficient A. From that, we can calculate the energy broadening, so we know that. And then we uh, convolve in the detector Lorentzian broadening, make a Voigt profile, and, and that's our simulated spectrum. And uh, keep in mind that this energy scale is determined by the characteristic transitions in gallium and arsenic. The characteristic transition energies from the colder um, region outside the focal spot. But our spectrometer um, has no sensitivity to the position of the X-ray emission in the source. It has no sensitivity because our detectors on the rolling circle where the lines are focused, regardless of where they come from spatially in the target. So this should be a good energy scale. As experimentalists, we're gonna say this is a good energy scale, no question. But we have to keep in mind that it comes from the characteristic X-ray lines outside the focal spot. So those those uh, atoms are fixed in space. They should have no Doppler broadening. They should have no bulk motion Doppler broadening. They're fixed. So this is our energy scale. Well, what do you notice here? There's something, there's a mismatch between the calculated spectrum and the experimental spectrum. Well, if that's the helium-like resonance line W in, in gallium, and, and this is the calculated helium-like resonance line W, there appears to be a shift of about 10 eV. So the experimental spectrum is shifted by about 10 eV to the higher energy, which is shorter wavelength, shift to the blue. So a Doppler blue shift uh, can occur when the radiation source is traveling toward the observer. That, that gives a blue shift. So we suspect that this uh, 10 eV blue shift is due to the plasma blowing off from that focal spot and uh, traveling somewhat toward the spectrometer and that gives our blue shift. Well, it's 10 eV. Uh, let's just shift the experimental spectrum uh, by, by 10 eV. And uh, this is reasonable because the energy scale is from these fixed gallium arsenide atoms, but the spectral lines here are from the hot plasma that's traveling toward the observer. So the, uh, the energy scale is from the fixed atoms and the hot plasma, which produces these spectral lines, are traveling toward us. So there should be a Doppler shift. And it looks like it's about 10 eV. So let's um, think about what we're going to do next. We think we understand our experimental energy scale. That's, that can't be wrong because we did it. You know, it's got to be right. So could, could the transition energies in fly check be inaccurate? You know, we always suspect the computations because the experiment is, is always right. So uh, let's look at the transition energies of this helium-like gallium resonance line W. It's a two-electron atom 
these transition energies can be accurately calculated. <laughs> so the grant code calculation dating back to 1980 for this transition is 96, 9628 EV. In 2005, the calculation was improved. Uh, uh, one more significant figure was added, so it's 9628.2 EV. This transition has been measured. Uh, I, I think some of the best measurements are from Afim Glitsky from 1984, from a, a low inductance vacuum spark, which is sort of like that pulse power machine. It's a very energetic, high voltage, high current, things blowing up and flowing. So in 84, he measured 9631, but with large error bars, plus or minus 7.5 EV, uh, because I think you worry about the Doppler shift due to plasma traveling with respect to the spectrometer. So in, in 88, he, he, he corrected for the plasma motion, 9627.5 plus or minus 0 0.7, which uh, um, overlaps with the most accurate calculation. And the fly check transition energy is 9628.4. So, so that's good. So the fly check transition energy is, is very accurate. So this indicates that the blue, 10 EV blue shift is, uh, is real and it's due to this uh, plasma flowing. And uh, we understand the origin of the 10 EV blue shift because we're, once again, our energy scale in the beginning was from the fixed gallium arsenide atoms and the hot spectral lines are from the flowing plasma. So that gives the 10 EV shift. It all makes sense. And if you calculate the flow velocity, it's 3 times 10 to the 7. 3 times 10 to the 7 is a generic plasma flow velocity. It comes from the hydrodynamic simulations of hot flowing plasma. So uh, if you had to guess what the expansion velocity would be, you would say 3 times 10 to the 7. And in fact, that's what we, that's what we observe. So this is all making sense. So now we've shifted the experimental spectrum to match the light check spectrum to correct for that plasma flow velocity. So now what do you notice? Well, there's this uh, T satellite transition, there's this bump in the calculated spectrum that, that does not occur in the experimental spectrum. And also the M satellite calculated is weaker than observed. But uh, if you remember what I asked you to keep in mind, the uh, T satellite should be 0.7 EV higher energy than the M satellite. So, so I, think, I think it's fair to, to just move Let's just move this T satellite transition energy to where it appears in the Cowan code and let's see what we get. So now this satellite feature agrees pretty well with the experimental data, but look, there's still this discrepancy here. And this feature is the helium-like uh, X transition and it appears to be at about a factor of two weaker in the calculation than we observe. And I suspect this line intensity is kind of hard to calculate maybe. And uh, uh, so let's just multiply that calculated energy. Uh, let's just multiply it by a factor of two. And uh, now we have a very good agreement. See? Okay, let's go back. Okay, we move the T satellite. We increase x by 2. Hey, we got good agreement. We have good agreement with a few adjustments. And that last one is suspect, you know, because we're just multiplying by a factor of 2. Sometimes we multiply by a factor of pi, you know, for no good reason or a factor of 2. So, so now 
I think we've made, made some new discoveries here about the comparison between the experimental spectrum and the simulated spectrum that should be pursued. And it hasn't yet been um, pursued, so I can't, can't really say any more about that. So now, uh, uh, Yuri Rochenko used uh, his code, Nomad, to do uh, very, very detailed calculations of the, uh, down here are the calculated, this is the experimental, uh, very detailed calculations of the features from the lower charge states. Uh, Lithium-like, helium-like light intensities are fairly easy to calculate, but uh, when you go to the lower charge states from the Cowan Co. GF, values, you saw there are many, many lines, dozens or hundreds of spectral lines. Much more difficult to calculate, and uh, Yuri uh, has calculated these spectra for different um, thermal uh, temperatures and different hot electron components. So we're kind of in the process of uh, matching up those calculations to the experimental spectrum. Okay, um, uh, could you let me know when the time is up because I don't remember when we started. Six more minutes. Six more minutes, okay. So now we understand the spectrum. This spectrometer has a very high spectral resolution, so we can now study the line shapes of these experimental features, the line shapes. To do that, we need to measure very well the instrumental broadening of our spectrometer. So we need to measure that in the lab. To do that, we use a laboratory tungsten spectrum and we uh, very, very accurately measure the width of uh, one of these spectral lines or several spectral lines. There are also some other features like these uh, very narrow dips in the diffraction, which is, uh, we understand where those come from. So let's pick a line that's isolated and, and not blended with weaker L transitions. So it, it's not gonna be L alpha one, that's very strong, which is nice, but it's blended with L alpha two. Uh, this line is isolated, but it's kind of weak. L beta one is very strong, but blended. L beta three is isolated and unblended, blended, weaker. So we pick L beta three, isolated, unblended, and we measure the width of that line. So the um, squares are the data, and, and the solid, sol solid line between the squares is our fitted Voigt profile. This is the uh, residual differences so we measure uh, Lorentzian component of the void is 12.8 uh, plus or minus some, some small value. Gaussian is 4.82. So that's the width of the overall broadening contributions to the, to the uh, Lorentzian and the Gaussian components fitted to the experimental spectral line. We know that the... Um, uh, Lorentzian component has a contribution from the natural uh, lifetime broadening, which we know from this reference. 12.8 uh, plus or minus rather large uh, uncertainty, 1.4 EV. Detector uh, Lorentzian is smaller. The result, if we subtract these two from the measured Lorentzian line width, is minus 0.8 plus or minus 1.4, so let's call that zero. Uh, within the experimental uncertainties, let's call that zero. The Gaussian component uh, has a contribution from the Gaussian detector full width half max. All of these values are full width half max. And a resultant Gaussian width after subtracting in quadrature, because this is a Gaussian, we're left with 4.75. EV, and that represents the intrinsic crystal broadening. So we've subtracted out all the contributions and we're left with the intrinsic crystal broadening. So this is the intrinsic uh, resolution of our spectrometer.
Uh, we measured the width of the gallium K-alpha-2 line in the spectrum, and we get uh, something similar after subtracting out all the contributions. Uh, we know that's from a fixed atom, so there's no Doppler broadening. So, you know, that's an accurate measurement. So now, now let's measure the um, width of a spectral lines from highly charged ions. And let's just pick the uh, uh, lithium, like gallium MT, uh, where the uh, two satellite lines are very close in energy, only 0.7 eV apart, and the uh, helium-like uh, X transition. So here are, are the measurements and the components for the uh, Lorentzian widths and, and the uh, Gaussian widths of those two spectral lines. So if you take a look here, we measure in uh, MT, we measure uh, Lorentzian full width half max of 0 0.41 eV. But look, X is uh, 0 0.01 eV, practically zero, much, much smaller. And that's because the natural width of the X line, which is a very, is uh, small, and the natural width of the satellite line, which is a very fast, uh, large A value, has a much larger natural lifetime Lorentz broadening. So uh, when we subtract these out, we get, uh, within the experimental measurements, we get zero. And then uh, Gaussian um, subtract out all the components, the crystal intrinsic broadening, which we've measured, uh, detector spatial resolution, the thermal ion Doppler width, and uh, uh, the result is uh, uh, 1.6 eV in one case and 2.55 eV in another case. So we're left with some, some uh, broadening, some uh, Gaussian broadening, so it's probably some kind of Doppler broadening of a couple of eV. What can that be due to? Well, uh, we think that's due to the uh, spreading, uh, turbulent spreading of that streaming velocity. So it's streaming at 3.7, 3 times 10 to the seventh centimeters per second, but there's some turbulence in that plasma as it flows toward us. In that turbulence, uh, uh, velocity would be, say, 5 times 10 to the 6 or 8 times 10 to the 6, which is smaller than 3 times 10 to the 7. So it's flowing toward us fast, 3 times 10 to the 7. Within that, there's some turbulence, which causes plasma flow, bulk motion uh, flowing with some Doppler motion superimposed on that, and it's about uh, 5 or 8 times 10 to the 6. I think I'm about uh, finished in time, but if I can use one or two more minutes, the, the uh, spectrometer we've been using has about 2,000 resolving power. It's about um, four or five EV intrinsic crystal broadening at, say, 10 kilovolts. So that ratio is about 2,000. We, we have now developed a spectrometer in the laboratory with 20,000 resolving power, so it's 10 times higher. So now we can measure line shapes almost 10 times better. But we haven't done the experiment yet. We have tested this spectrometer in the lab by measuring the copper K-alpha 1 and 2 lines from a laboratory copper X-ray source. These are the um, 2p to 1s uh, single hole transitions, but we see these wings on the lower energy side, and uh, this has been observed before at a synchrotron using days or weeks of taking data. Uh, we did this in about five minutes. And th these features are uh, double hole transitions, so double hole 2p3d uh, decaying via a, a 2p to 1s transition with a 3d uh, spectator hole. So 3d is high lying, so the lines are closely bl blended with apparent single hole transitions. <laughs>
if you plot this on a log scale, there's this bump. And this bump is due to a t double hole transition where the spectator is a, is a 2p electron. So lower lying, larger energy shift from the parent line. And this has also been observed in uh, synchrotron measurements. So this is a double hole uh, transition with a 2p electron. That, that should look very familiar to you because in helium-like dielectronic satellites to the hydrogen-like resonance line, most of those satellites are from 2p squared levels. And then the satellites with uh, uh, N equal 3 spectator electron are closer to the resonance line just like this. So there's a correspondence between the transitions in hot plasma from doubly excited levels to transitions and neutrals with two holes. Physics is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>